Australia, in the decades after World War II, was a safe and happy place, especially on the beach in summertime. But in the mid-1960s, two terrible events, one in New South Wales and the other in South Australia, brought that era to an end. You're about to see the strange story of how three children went to an Adelaide beach on a summer's day and simply disappeared without a trace. But first, we look at another event that also took place at a beach. The brutal murders known simply to police investigators as Wanda. The main Sydney police switchboard jammed with calls. Two 15-year-old girls have been savagely murdered in sand hills at Wanda Beach, south of the city. A record-breaking cash reward is offered in a desperate effort to find the killer. Hundreds of calls an hour are coming in, and overworked detectives struggle to follow every lead. The sheer volume of information and the workload facing detectives make this the biggest murder investigation in Australian history. Now, after more than 40 years, police are still on the trail of the Wanda killer. But despite all the leads they've received, they continue to look for a silent witness who might have vital information. And now, the mother of one of the victims has finally broken her silence to appeal for more help. This is the lower arc of Botany Bay, south of Sydney, and it was here that Captain James Cook became the first European to land on Australia's east coast. On the other side of this peninsula are the sand hills of Wanda, part of Sydney's longest continuous strand of shimmering ocean beaches. And it was in that summer playground in 1965 that the lives of two pretty young teenagers came to a sudden and violent end. Seven years earlier, in 1958, Marianne Schmidt arrives in Australia with her parents, Elizabeth and Helmut, and five brothers and sisters. The family is a small part of the great wave of war-weary Germans who've taken up the Australian government's offer of a new life. After a few years living in migrant camps, they move to a typical suburban home in Brush Road Ride in Sydney's inner northwest. But soon after, tragedy strikes when Mary Ann's father falls ill and dies. Her mother, Elizabeth, poor and barely able to speak English, struggles to support and care for her six children on the meagre welfare payments of the time. Well, not easy. You haven't got any pride left and, and whatever. You have to go and ask for help. So the Smith family did help pretty a lot. Whatever, I, I didn't have a phone. See, if you want to buy the bills, everything, you couldn't have a proper meal for the kids. Not with nine pound a week, okay? Although many of the Brush Road neighbours make little effort to get to know the Schmidt family, Mary Ann makes friends with Christine Sharrock, a girl of her own age who lives with her grandparents next door. So I've been like twins. Uh, I don't know, because I just clicked when we moved in. She was a nice girl. The two girls spend a lot of time together. They're normal teenagers, finishing high school with plans and dreams for the future. Like millions of Australian teenagers in the summer of 1964-65, Mary Ann Schmidt and Christine Sharrock worship the surf culture and idolise the new pop music bands. Both are quiet and shy. They have no boyfriends, although that doesn't stop them writing in their diaries about the boys they meet, the sun, surf and endless summer of life at the beach. One of Christine Sharrock's close friends at school remembers her as being polite and well behaved. She was always very respectful of teachers, in particular at school, and respectful of other people, and very well mannered, very polite, um, probably more so than some of us. In summertime, the Schmidt family, and many others like them, would head for Cronulla Beach to escape the stifling heat of Sydney's sprawling western and southern suburbs. 
Cronulla Beach was important because it was accessible by train. We were all pretty savvy about how to use trains, probably more savvy than our parents ever gave us credit for. The Schmidt children had been to Cronulla Beach several times that summer. With Elizabeth Schmidt still in hospital, recovering from an operation, Mary Ann and Christine make plans to take the four little ones again. Ten-year-old Peter, Trixie, age nine, Wolfgang, who's seven, and five-year-old Norbert. In what will later become a widely discussed incident, Christine talks about going back to the sand hills at Wanda. Crime writer Alan Whitaker, who's written extensively about the Wanda killings, believes this is a crucial clue. Christine had a conversation with her grandmother as she prepared um, her things for the trip to the beach, saying that she hoped that they'd be able to walk through the sand hills again. Her grandmother asked her not to do so because they had the younger children, the younger Schmidt children, with them, but Christine was determined to do so. Detectives would later question why Christine Sharrock was so keen to return to the Sand Hills. Was it possible that the girls had met or seen someone there on a previous visit? Were they hoping to meet him there again? Friends who knew the girls well have some doubts about this theory. Now, at the same time, we were all absolutely convinced that, um, that what had happened had not been something that Christine would have brought on herself because Christine was only too well aware of, um, of the mores and the values that, um, that were being taught. Mary Ann's mother, Elizabeth Schmidt, says the girls were always warned not to talk to strangers. Well, I didn't talk about boys or anything, not in front of mum anyhow. I just said, don't get any lifts when you go on the street. Then I walked from, from West Ride to Brussels to... From Brush Road to West Ride, put it that way. And uh, if some car should stop and you want a lift, I said, don't take a lift because you don't know what happened. That was it. Don't, don't talk to strangers. Shortly before 8.30 a.m. on January 11th, 1965, the fatal excursion begins. The girls leave home with the little ones. They change trains at Redfern, on the edge of the city centre. In reconstructing the final movements of the children, um, Trixie Schmidt told police that the girls were seen talking to a 15-year-old boy uh, on the train to Redfern. The boy hopped off at Redfern while the rest of the family uh, caught the adjoining train uh, to Cronulla. The children arrive at Cronulla station and walk down towards the beach. The Schmidt children have some sandwiches and drinks in a beach bag with their towels. Christine Shurrock had no food, but had a thermos of cold drink in a beach bag along with her towel, a plastic purse containing a one pound note, a pair of sunglasses and a transistor radio. Somewhere on the way, she spends part of the money, possibly on some food. The six of them walk through to the beach, where they settle down and play, and later eat their lunch. Seven-year-old Wolfgang watches Christine and Mary Ann chatting to a youth who's carrying a knife in a holster and is using a spear to catch crabs in rock crevices. Then, the fateful decision is made to go for a walk. In the early afternoon, the girls decided to take the, long, the younger children on a walk to Wanda Beach into the sand hills. This is a distance of some kilometres and it was uh, about 400 metres past the Wanda Beach Surf Club that uh, the children complained that the wind was whipping their legs and it was very uncomfortable that they were tied. Come on. All right, let's go, guys. Up here. Ow! Oh, oh, nice. All right. The girls decided to leave the children there with their towels for protection. Uh, Kristen even gave a transistor radio that she got for Christmas uh, to keep the children company. And on the pretext of heading back to the southern end of the beach to get their things, the girls headed off but inexplicably, the two girls head off in the opposite direction, north, into the sand hills. Ten-year-old Peter Schmidt shouts at the girls. You're going the wrong way! No, we're going mad. But the girls just giggle and give a flippant reply. It's the last time all the children will see Christine and Mary Ann alive. Although the weather had turned blustery, 
There were still a number of people in the sandhills and on the beach. One of those was a local man, Dennis Dostin, who was walking with his young son. Dostin, who prefers that his face not be shown, saw the girls walking over the sand hills. Well, what really drew him attention to the girl was when she kept looking over her shoulder, very much in a manner to see if she was being followed. She did that two or three times, and uh, then I lost interest in, uh, I could see nothing behind any reason why she should be uh, such an action, and I uh, just continued on my merry way. Police can only conjecture if somebody had arranged with them or whether the girls took it upon themselves to go up into the sand hills and uh, to meet somebody that they had met early that day or on previous visits. Soon afterwards, out of the sight of any witnesses, the girls are brutally attacked and murdered. The killer strikes at Mary Ann Schmidt first. In a frenzy, he stabs her a total of 14 times. One blow is directly into her heart. A horrified Christine Sharrock tries to escape, running, screaming over the dunes. only to be chased and caught by the killer. He bashes her hard with a blunt object, fracturing her skull. He then stabs her at least six times and drags her body back, leaving a trail of blood on the sand and on tufts of grass. It's now that he attempts to have sex with the dead or dying girls. He hacks at Mary Ann's black one-piece bathing suit, pulling it up around her breasts. He grabs at Christine's blood-stained white shorts and thrusts them up into her crotch. Samples of sperm are found, but strangely, a later autopsy will show both girls' hymens are still intact. The children wait. They play in the sand and listen to music on a transistor radio. One hour passes and then two. Finally, around 5 p.m., with no sign of the girls, the children walk back south along the beach to Cronulla, where they will retrieve their bags where they left them in the rocks and will catch the last train home at 6 p.m. When they arrive home, Christine Sharrock's grandmother next door is told the girls are missing and calls police. The following day, a local man, Peter Smith, is walking in the sand hills with his nephews when one of the boys suddenly spots something. As I approached it, it looked like a, a person laying in the sand, sort of half covered, but the person was face down, so uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a normal, normal position to be lying in. So I sort of scratched a bit of sand away from around the head and I decided it wasn't a mannequin at all, it was uh, in fact a body. Deeply shocked, confused and shaking, and with the boys peppering him with questions, he rushes to the nearest building, the Wanda Beach Surf Club residence, more than two kilometres away, where lifesaver Barry Ezzy is on duty. I think I was in the first aid room and he came to the door. He looked very, um, what can I say, he looked very concerned or upset. I sort of picked that straight away and I knew that there was something wrong. He had two little boys with him. And he said, I've discovered a body in the, in the sand dunes further up the beach. And I said, well, we better get the police down here. Newspaper photographer Jeff Jessup is one of the first on the scene. So I, um, I sort of just slowly went toward the sand hills and um, I came across the two feet, which, you know, really, it's sort of, uh, you think, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, and it takes a few seconds for you to realise that um, they're two human feet. 
But then, suddenly, one officer makes a further shocking discovery. So I was standing there looking at the grave site scene. He said, um, there's three feet sticking out of the grave. And I said, yeah, there is. So that's when we realised there was two people there. While a search gets underway, detectives link the find to the missing persons report and visit their homes. They speak to the children and Christine's grandmother and make the identification. Over the next few days, the young Schmidt children are interviewed many times. They're taken back to Cronulla, where detectives walk with them as the little ones recount their movements and explain how the girls went off walking into the sand hills. It's then that seven-year-old Wolfgang drops a bombshell, telling them that he saw the girls walking off into the sand hills with the youth he'd seen earlier chasing crabs. He describes the youth as having fair or light brown hair and a smooth face, wearing only light grey trousers and carrying a blue towel. Wolfgang says he still had his knife in the holster, but no spear. He was trying to engage the girls in conversation and was asking them questions. Wolfgang says the girls did not reply and the youth's face looked angry. Please tell me your name. He tells detectives he later saw the youth walking back alone. From Wolfgang's recollections, detectives try to make up an identical picture of the youth, but this is abandoned as the descriptions become vague and vary too much. Nevertheless, the fair-haired youth becomes the main person of interest to police. As the investigation continues, some puzzling clues emerge. A post-mortem shows undigested cabbage and celery in Christine's stomach. More mysterious is the finding that Christine has a blood alcohol level of 0.015, enough for her to have consumed a glass of beer. Although fermented food can sometimes produce alcohol in the stomach, expert opinion was that this alcohol was taken orally. Police believe that they may have known the person who killed them. Um, they could have sat quietly, maybe even shared a sip of beer, maybe shared a, a meal, such as a Chico roll, and then things have turned violent. These Wanda Sandhills are a popular recreation area, but they're also isolated and very private. Captain Cook Drive beyond the Sandhills over there provides easy access, but it also provides easy escape, especially for a killer with blood-stained clothes. And to this very day, police still believe someone must have seen him escape. Uh, a number of other witnesses came forward, two young girls riding horses in the Sandhills, um, later told police of a man walking naked between the sand hills. Now, Wanda Beach, especially the sand hills area, was known as a, a, a pest area where people often uh, went into the, into the area uh, to sunbake nude or to take uh, part in illicit uh, sexual acts. And so the girls were actually walking into an area that they weren't that familiar with. Um, other suspects saw people um, jogging through the hills, um, saw a man um, hiding under uh, corrugated iron, obviously perving on some of the young women up there. On January 20th, funerals for the two girls are held. Australia is shocked and saddened by the murders, and the funerals are widely reported by all media. The families must carry their grief publicly. After a month, with still no breakthrough in the investigation, the government offers a record reward of £10,000, equal to $20,000. It provokes an avalanche of information. In the early days of the investigation, every 16-year-old boy in Cronulla with blonde hair was a suspect. And uh, when you think of the 1960s, that's literally thousands of suspects. Of course, police became uh, swamped with paperwork and erroneous calls. One woman who sunbathes regularly near the Wanda Surf Club calls police to report one particular man who harassed women on the beach. She tells detectives how the man sat beside her and propositioned her using obscene, insulting and degrading language. Lifesaver Barry Ezzy remembers him well. He was an unusual sort of a character and he was uh, annoying girls on the beach at that time. And I asked him to leave the beach um, 
because of his behaviour, his annoying girls, and uh, he became a bit of a suspect, I believe. The police were very interested in that bit of information, but to my knowledge, he was never, ever located, and I never saw him again. Um, and we had to sort of escort him from the beach and send him on his way. Investigator Mick Ashwood of the Unsolved Homicide Review Team says this man may have seen the murderer. That male wore a white singlet top or, or a shirt, carried a, a radio over his shoulder, uh, possibly balding in appearance, and he would approach women in the area of uh, North Cronulla, Cronulla and Wanda Beach, and he'd talk to them about sex, spoke to them about their sexuality, and on occasions produced a book on, which contained cuts out of pornography. That was the major focus of the investigation, to identify this person. Another problem for investigators is that despite an intensive search, no murder weapon is ever found. Tons of sand from around the murder scene are sifted for clues, and various items are found, including a knife blade with some blood stains but police are unable to link it to the crime. 14 months after the murders, in April 1966, the coroner hands down his finding. By now, police have conducted more than 7,000 interviews. The Wanda murders are rapidly turning into a classic cold case. But no unsolved murder is completely abandoned. In the case of Wanda, Police have been looking closely at a number of known psychopathic killers who were in Sydney at the time. The search for the killer of Christine Sharrock and Mary Ann Schmidt at Wanda Beach Sandhills in 1965 became the largest murder investigation in Australian history. The offer of a record reward and the massive response from the public gave detectives thousands of leads, and each had to be followed and investigated. Detective Mick Ashwood says it was a very thorough investigation. Their investigation practices they utilise in terms of contemporary homicide investigation were outstanding. They didn't spare the resources. Their commitment to it was quite significant. We thought it would the approach from the force as to how they managed the investigation was, was one of the best we've seen in our reviews of all the cases. Eight years after Wanda, in 1973, a schizophrenic named Alan Raymond Bassett is convicted of the brutal murder of a woman in Wollongong and sentenced to life in a psychiatric prison. One seasoned investigator, Detective Sergeant Sess Johnson, thinks Bassett is the Wanda killer even though he has no evidence. Bassett gives Sess a painting, and Sess believes it could hold clues to a number of murder scenes that only the killer would know, including red blood on grass, a broken knife, and what looks like a girl's body and hand. Sess Johnson died in 1980 in a pedestrian accident and went to his grave unable to prove that Bassett was the Wanda killer. Bassett has consistently denied any involvement and has now been released into the community. Another suspect is a man who's now dead. He was a sexual fiend that the American media dubbed the beauty queen killer. Christopher Wilder was put on probation at the age of 17 for his part in a gang rape at a Sydney beach and he would have been aged 19 at the time of the Wanda murders. In 1982, he was arrested for the abduction and sexual assault of two girls, only to be released on bail. He immediately flew to America, where he went on a rape and murder spree across the country, killing eight women before being shot dead by state troopers. A third Wanda person of interest has been Australia's most notorious pedophile, Derek Percy. Percy was found not guilty by reason of insanity of the mutilation murder of 12-year-old Yvonne Elizabeth Tui in Victoria in 1969. He would have been 16 at the time of the Wanda murders. Detectives say there's a possibility Percy, who was a keen sailor, 
was in Sydney to attend some championships with his father at Botany Bay on the edge of the Wanda Sandhills. Even more shocking is the chilling discovery that if he did visit Sydney, Percy would have stayed with his grandmother, who lived less than a kilometre from the Wanda victims' homes in Brush Road Ride. To reach Botany Bay by rail from the ride area would mean travelling on the same train line as the murdered girls. Derek Percy is being held in Victoria's Ararat Jail at the Governor's Pleasure, another name for an indefinite jail term. He's been repeatedly denied release on parole and is currently Australia's longest serving prisoner. It's also been reported that exercise books seized from his cell show graphic details of plans for the torture and mutilation of children. Percy has vehemently denied he committed the Wanda murders and also protests that he's innocent of other horrific crimes. There are a number of cases involving children that police say may yet prove to have links to Percy. They say Percy has allegedly admitted to being in St Kilda in Melbourne on the day eight-year-old Linda Stillwell disappeared in August 1968. She's never been found. And detectives working on the murder of three-year-old Simon Brooke believe they can place Percy in Sydney in May 1968 when the toddler's body was found in bushland. It's also possible that instead of being victims of a psychopathic killer, Christine and Mary Ann died because they stumbled upon some kind of illegal activity in the dunes that day and had to be silenced. The sperm sample taken from the crime scene established a probable blood type, but identifying the killer will require some solid new evidence. We're hoping that there is a witness there in Wanda Beach and Sandhills, either on the 11th of January 1965, in the afternoon or perhaps, perhaps the evening, or perhaps on the 1st and 2nd of January when the girls were there initially, that did see either the crime or the person who committed the crime. We've heard the person may have had blood on them after the crime. It's 42 years on after this has occurred. Uh, society's changed. There were some people uh, doing illegal things in that time in those sand hills. And we think now it's a time for that person to come forward and tell what they saw. And they may not think it's significant, but I think for the family of Marianne and Christine, they'd like some closure and to have this case solved. For Elizabeth Schmidt, there is no closure, no explanation as to why her beloved daughter Mary Ann had to die. If I tell you, I'm not a churchgoer, okay? But walking down the street and pry, that happened a lot. Going shopping, the tears running and crying. I still got the question why. You know, I said it at that time. So I find an age corner girl to wait for it. Why has to be the ones who say no? And I cope it. That's my opinion. Still got the questions, boy. One of the original investigators on the case, retired Detective Sergeant Barry Reynolds, also believes someone in the dunes that day saw something, but still hasn't come forward. I, I think there is somebody still alive today that could uh, provide an end to the mystery uh, if they were prepared to come forward and tell the authorities what their thoughts are. Detectives believe they will eventually find out who killed Mary Ann and Christine. But all they can say officially at the moment is that they're seeking four persons of interest and that they have two firm suspects. If it would help, if somebody would know anything, any little bit, I would like that. At least after 40 years, it might come to the end. The murders at Wanda were a frightening sign that the era of innocence in Australia 
an era of safe streets and unlocked doors, was coming to an end. It ended forever a year later, when three small children went for a swim at an Adelaide beach and disappeared without a trace. Gerard Croisset, Europe's best-known celebrity clairvoyant, famous for his work with police around the world, arrives in Adelaide, South Australia, in 1966. It's nine months since Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont, aged nine, seven and four, vanished from an Adelaide beach. The massive search for them has found nothing, and the bizarre arrival of Europe's leading clairvoyant is a desperate gamble to try to turn up some clue that might help find the children. Glenelg Beach in Adelaide is the place where, in 1835, a group of men came ashore to establish the free colony of South Australia. It was at this beach that the three little Beaumont children were last seen alive more than 40 years ago. In the 1950s, the quiet suburbs in South Australia's capital city of Adelaide are said to be the best place in the world to raise children. Neighbours know neighbours, and everyone looks out for everyone else. It's here, in 1955, that ex-serviceman Grant Beaumont, known to everyone as Jimmy, marries a local girl, Nancy Ellis, known to her friends simply as Nats. Their first child, Jane, is born in 1956. Another daughter is born two years later, in 1958, and named Anna Kathleen. Finally, in 1962, a son is born, named Grant, after his father. It's Australia Day, Wednesday, January 26th, 1966, and the children are still on their long summer holidays. As the day dawns, Nance knows it's going to be a real scorcher, and so she gives the children permission to come here to Glenelg Beach, but she insists they take the bus rather than ride their bikes. Out we go. Okay, kids, you're going to the beach now. They were dressed in swimming costumes, shorts and sandals, and Jane carried their beach towels in a greeny-blue airline-style shoulder bag. It just wasn't uh, out of step for that time for the children to go off um, to the beach uh, with uh, just the things they were carrying. Nance gives the children money for a little lunch and for bus fares, and this will later prove to be an important clue. It's just after 10 a.m. when the children board the bus. The children don't return on the midday bus. And then, when the two o'clock bus comes and goes, Nance starts to worry. By the time Jimmy arrives home shortly after three o'clock, Nance is starting to panic. Oh, Jim, Jim, the kids haven't come home yet. I sent them on the bus at 10 o'clock to the beach and they're still not home. I home think yet. you need to go looking for them, please. I'll go for I'll go. Jimmy immediately drives to the beach. I can't find them. You'll have to come and help oh. me. Unable to see them, he rushes back to pick up Nance, and together they search the streets and check their friends' houses. All the time, the terrified couple wonders what could have happened. Have they run away? That's impossible. They're happy, loyal children. Drowned or had an accident. Surely three kids can't drown unseen in a calm sea with so many people around. So if they go further up, well. would they walk up the other end of the beach? Would they stay down yeah, here? Yeah, well, let's look down here. Slowly, it dawns. It's unthinkable, but the only logical explanation. A word that's so frightening, it can barely be spoken. Abduction. It's now 5 p.m. Jimmy and Nance decide it's time to go to the Glenelg police station, where Detective Moston Matters is on duty. Both of them were living in hope that the children had overstayed their stay at the beach or that they'd gone to you know, their friends' places and, and stay there to play. And they were still living in that hope that uh, everything was all right. Because naturally, as, as time went on, they became more and more concerned and uh, uh, that was the situation. And so begins what will become 
one of the most famous missing persons cases in Australian criminal history. News flashes break into late night radio programs announcing the disappearance. A deployment of uh, uniformed police came down later that evening, about 30 police officers, uniformed police officers, and it was organised that, uh, that we do a thorough search of uh, the surrounding area, the beach area, the sand hills north and south of Canelwood, and all the drains and paddocks and surrounding areas that was thoroughly searched. So that was put into operation. Uh, the airport was... Um, Surveillance was put on the airport and on the interstate rail line in case um, you know, someone was um, endeavouring to get taken away. Uh, all main arterial roads leading out of the state were all um, um, set up, uh, roadblocks were set up there in case. But of course, as I said before, unfortunately, um, there could have been a time lapse of some six to eight hours before the public really became aware of the children were missing, and in that time, that gave the the offender quite a lot of time to, uh, get, to get away. Jimmy continues to drive around the streets, searching all night, vowing he won't sleep until the children are found. Nancy was so distraught, she was sedated, and it wasn't until several days later that she could talk to the press about her fears. By that time, all of Australia had been alerted that the children were missing, and uh, uh, it had been part of uh, countrywide coverage. Former CIB detective Peter Vogel is assigned to the case. And we received quite a few telephone calls uh, with people uh, giving us information, as well as people calling at the station and telling us what they saw and uh, what they believe could have happened and so on. After swimming, the children walk up to a lawn near the beach called Collie Reserve to play. <laughs> Witnesses tell of seeing a man with fair hair watching them. He then approaches them and joins in the play. Journalist Bill Perry covered the story. There's an elderly couple who was sitting on a grass verge, which was outside of the old surf club uh, in those days. There were two taps. There was a bubbler and there was a tap for washing the sand off your feet. They saw the kids approaching and they knew them. Uh, I don't think they spoke to them, but they knew them. Um, then they saw them and observed them for several minutes, uh, washing their feet under the, uh, under the tap and washing the uh, sand off their feet. The stranger was said to be wearing brief Speedo-style bathers, dark blue with a white stripe. And he appeared like the typical Australian surfy type of a person. And uh, this person was playing with the children for quite some time and the children seemed to be enjoying his company. At one point here at Collie Reserve, the man even approaches the couple and asks have they seen anyone near what he describes as our clothes. He says we've had some money taken from our clothes. One female witness watching them quite closely feels something isn't quite right when she sees the man helping nine-year-old Jane to get dressed. The witnesses see the man then walk to the changing sheds to dress. They watch the children cross the path that divides the collie reserve and stand near a seat apparently waiting for the stranger to return. It's the staff at a cake shop near the beach who give police details of the last corroborated sighting. There was one other witness or evidence that the children did go into a shop known as Wenzel's Bakery and purchase some pies and pasties around lunchtime and, and handed a, uh, a note, a Commonwealth Bank note, which was unusual because the children didn't have it. The mother gave them six shillings in cash. So that was a cause of a line of inquiry is what the children had. The children get hold of this uh, Commonwealth banknote when, uh, when they weren't given it. The only possible explanation is that they were given the money by a stranger. What we now know about people who prey on children is that they're very adept at gaining children's confidences 
um, whether or not this man knew them from their previous visits or was, was able to gain their confidence just in the hour at the beach. Uh, the reality was uh, the children disappeared soon after and he is the only person that the police uh, have on their books as being a person of interest in this case. Then the Sunday Mail newspaper finally puts the unspoken into print. Under the headline, Sex Crime Now Feared, the paper announces that police fear the children have been murdered by a sex pervert. I asked them what's your, what's the official um, police um, uh, verdict and they told me that they thought the um, children had been murdered um, and, uh, and buried um, within a kilometre of the beach. Um, they thought that was because you couldn't um, uh, transport three kids into any great distance without being seen, and if they're in a car, they'd have to pull up at a garage or pull up for something to eat or to drink. By February, the investigation has produced no new leads. The government offers a paltry £250 reward. That's just $500 in the new decimal currency. An angry public, and even Jimmy Beaumont himself, contribute enough to bring that to $10,000. New evidence is desperately needed. But instead, the case now takes a sudden turn into the world of the supernatural. Nine months after the sudden disappearance of Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont from Adelaide's Glenelg Beach, police investigators run out of any worthwhile new leads. The only clue is a less than reliable sketch of a man seen playing with the children near the time they were last seen alive. Local people, supported by the news media, decide to consult a famous Dutch clairvoyant, Gerard Kruiset, who has worked with police internationally to find missing persons. Local businessman and Beaumont family friend Barry Blackwell agree to help. Then I was approached by a Carl Luf, a Dutchman, and he came and asked me if I could help to film the coastline so they could send a film to Croisette, which I agreed, um, which we did, and we got back from Croisette um, plans or drawings and details of the children's last walk. While skeptics have always challenged Croisette's claims to have found any missing persons using his clairvoyant visions, his biography is a worldwide bestseller. When asked about the Beaumont children, Croisette says he feels they have not been kidnapped, but have been buried alive. Crowds immediately flock to Glenelg Beach to dig for evidence, and others call police to report the existence of various caves and hollows along the coast. Croisette says he sees a vision of the children crawling past a barrier and warning sign and through a little hole and suddenly sand or water tumbles in on them. We went back to the area where the, the barrier and the warning sign was and we found a, a giant drain that went into the uh, sea which was completely blocked and uh, we borrowed a fire hose from the fire department and uh, spent a day trying to unblock it, which we eventually didn't because there was nothing there. I read the following day in the advertiser that I'd offered to fly Croisset out here, which I hadn't, but anyway, they, they said it, so I went along with it and I went into KLM, the Dutch airline, and, and paid his fare. Croisset arrives to a surging crowd of reporters hurling questions at him in Dutch and English. He announces he will accept no money for his work. That day, Jimmy and Nance Beaumont are interviewed on television about Croisset's arrival. Jim, what sort of questions is one asked at a time like this? Well, what can you say, actually? I mean, I know many people all over Australia uh, really feel, feel for us. And um, um, well, what can you say at this moment? I mean, we've been hanging on for nine months and 14 days now. Sure. And, uh, well, we just got to just wait and hope and pray. Do you hope that uh, Dr. Crozet succeeds, Jim? Oh, well, I mean, that's his, 
That's his uh, belief, and uh, I really appreciate uh, him coming over. I mean, uh, to uh, to find the children, but uh, uh, not the way that he says, because I don't believe that the children are. Uh, dead, and I'll cling on to the hope until there's evidence, any evidence found otherwise. I think it'd be very difficult for him to, to meet us. I think he's a very feeling man, yeah. and I think that his main objective is finding the children more so than talking to us, perhaps. The following day, Croisette tours the beach and is then taken to a warehouse where the Beaumont children had once played. The warehouse has just been renovated and has a new, thick concrete floor. Croisette, accompanied by detectives, walks across the floor and then clearly and firmly he tells them this is where they're buried. In my opinion, I have found a spot where the children are or would be. Where is that spot? Where is that, sir? Where is that, sir? Where is that, sir? Where is that, sir? Where I was this morning uh, at the factory. But as the area was thoroughly cleared before the floor was laid, the government declines to excavate under the building. Thirty years later, the entire area under the floor finally will be dug up and nothing will be found. Convinced the children are buried under the warehouse, Croisette declares his job's done and prepares to return home. But at the last minute, he's invited to visit here with Jimmy and Nance Beaumont. Yes, he told Nancy Beaumont that he believed that their children had uh, met with a tragic accident, they hadn't been abducted. And she said to him, I don't believe that, I think my children are still alive. And he said to her, I hope that I am wrong and you are right. As far as police are concerned, the clairvoyant stunt has been a total failure. But Croisette gives one final news conference. You asked me the question, have you got any idea yourself where the children are? He said, my impression is that they are near the wall of that storeroom where the children were last. Where exactly In is his... that? Well, that's Wilton Street, Somerton Park. Yes. That is Wilson Street. Somewhere. I go. I go. black star mid in the backhouse. If I am standing mid in the middle of that storeroom, ga ik niet verder als nacht. I go no further. 40 than, meters in the room. Uh, than 40 meters in a circle. Then we're sure they're dead, Mr. Corbett. What? Yeah. Als ik te zeg dat ze daar om If I say, if I say they are bar buried there, I am sure. Nance and Jimmy's pain is extended further by constant visits to their home by a gaggle of religious fanatics obsessed with the supernatural and the paranormal. A cruel hoax is played when four letters purporting to be from Jane Beaumont are sent to Jimmy and Nance, raising their hopes yet again that the children are still alive. The investigation remains open and then in 1973 Adelaide is again gripped by fear as two more children disappear in a crowd of people. This time, the Adelaide Oval during a football game. Over the years, many other abductions and murders are linked to the Beaumont case, but there is never a firm connection, never a clear suspect. In the 40 years since the Beaumont children disappeared without trace, some 10,000 separate leads have been given to detectives. Some of those leads point to convicted murderers or pedophiles. Each one raises the hopes of Jimmy and Nance Beaumont and renews their distress. She told me that, um, that she, you know, she just couldn't bear the thought that they were buried in somebody's backyard and she told me what beautiful children they were and what lovely, loving ways and simple ways they had. Um, she said that she'd thought of taking her own life because she had nothing to live for. She had nothing to wake up for, the whole family was gone. For years, the grieving parents stay on at the empty little house in Somerton Park. A heartbroken Nance tells one interviewer, what if the children came back one day and knocked on the door and I wasn't there? But eventually, 
the tragedy takes its toll. Jimmy and Nance leave the house and separate to start new lives. For the rest of Australia, the great era of safety and innocence ended on January 26th, 1966. These days, few parents in Australian cities will allow young children to go off on any excursion alone. Today, if they're still alive, Jane, Anna and Grant would be middle-aged. The police investigation is ongoing.